Chapter One: Huck, Tom, and Jim. My name is Huckleberry Finn, and I live in a small town on the Mississippi River called Saint Petersburg. My friend Tom Sawyer also lives there. We don't get bored often because we have lots of adventures, and we like to think of new games to play together. He lives with his aunt Polly, and I live with the widow Douglas and her sister Miss Watson. I live with them because my mother is dead, and nobody knows where my father is. It's not easy to live in a house because I like being outside most of the time. Before I came to live with the widow and her sister, I didn't have a house, so nobody told me what to do. Now the two women always tell me what to do. Miss Watson often says, "Huck, do your spelling lessons." She wants me to do what she says all the time. This is difficult, so sometimes I'm sad. It's also difficult to go to school, but the widow Douglas thinks school is good for me. I'm learning to spell. Read and write a little, and I'm also learning some math. I'm only a boy, but I have a lot of money. Tom and I found twelve thousand dollars in a cave once. It's ours now, and we each have six thousand dollars. A man named Judge Thatcher is keeping mine for me because I'm still just a boy. I know my father wants my money, so it's a good thing he isn't here. Before I found the money. He often hit me. I hid in the woods most of the time when he was here. I'm sorry I can't tell you I never saw him again, because I did. This is the story of all the adventures I had because my father returned. It all started one winter morning. After breakfast, I went into the garden. There was snow on the ground, and I saw a footprint. I looked down. And saw the shape of a cross in one of the footprints. It was made to keep the devil away. Suddenly, I was very afraid. I knew that footprint well. It was my father's. I needed help, and there was only one person I could ask. That person was Jim, Miss Watson's slave. Jim was a tall black man. He had a ball made of animal hair. The ball knew everything about the future. I wanted to ask Jim about my future and my father's. So that night, I went to see Jim in his room. My father is here again. I know because I found his footprints in the snow. I cried. Jim listened to his ball and said, "Your old father doesn't know what to do. Sometimes he wants to go away, and sometimes he wants to stay. What about me?" I asked. The ball says your future will be very difficult, but also very happy. Don't go near the river, because there is trouble there. Jim answered. I went to my room. I felt very afraid again. I opened the door and suddenly saw the man I was so afraid of. He was sitting on my bed. It was my father. Listening activity. Huck, come here, please. I must tell you about your jobs for today. Yes, ma'am. Here I am. Good. Now, as it is a lovely day, I would like you to do all the outside jobs first. You can start by hanging out the washing. Everything needs to be dry by tonight. Okay, I can do that. Then can I cut the grass? That's fun. Good idea. Herbie's very dirty and needs a wash. After you cut the grass, can you give him a wash at the back of the garden? I can try, but you know what he's like. He won't stop moving, and the soapy water goes everywhere. <laughs> yes, Huck, I know. But that animal loves you so much. He just wants to play. Okay, then can I go and see Tom and the other boys? No, not then. There are still some jobs inside the house. I want you to tidy your bedroom. It's a complete mess. Also, remember to clean the floor and under the bed. Okay, I'll do that. Then can I go out? All right, you can go out. But one last thing: 
This morning I am making a pie for poor Mrs. Richards. You know she is very ill at the moment. She lives near Tom, so you can pass by her house on your way. So many things to do. I must start immediately. Chapter Two: A Clever Escape. I saw my father so long ago, but I knew he was the man I was looking at now. He was about fifty and had long, dirty black hair and a black beard. His face was very white, and he was wearing very old clothes. His shoes had holes in them, and so did his hat. He looked at me, then said, "So you're wearing clean new clothes?" Yes. The widow Douglas bought them for me. I answered, "I know. I also know she's sending you to school. You must think you're better than your father now." He said, without thinking. I answered, "Maybe I do, and maybe I don't." I'm your father, not that widow Douglas. You're my son again now, and all sons do what their fathers tell them. He said. I was even more afraid now, so I said, "Yes, father." I was afraid to look at him. He got up and said, "I know Judge Thatcher has your money. I'm your father, so it's my money now." Then he turned and left. I knew he was going to get drunk. The next morning, he went to Judge Thatcher's house. He tried to get my six thousand dollars, but the judge didn't let him have it. I was happy. Because I knew Judge Thatcher and the widow Douglas were not afraid of my father. It was a good thing the judge and the widow also helped to keep me in school. But one day in the spring, my father found me on my way to school. He took me up the river in a boat, and then he made me go into the woods with him. We walked for a long time and came to an old, empty cabin made of wood. He made me stay there for many days and nights. My clean new clothes became old and dirty. I didn't go to school any more, and I started to say bad words again. My father started to hit me more and more often. Once he left me in the house for three days. I finally decided to run away. My father was always careful not to leave any knives in the house whenever he left me there. But one day I found an old saw. I decided. I could make a hole through the wall with it. The next morning, my father told me to go to the river and catch some fish for breakfast. While I was by the river, I suddenly saw an empty canoe on the river. This was my chance. I decided to hide the canoe and use it that night. Later, my father went into town and left me in the house. I got out my saw and started to work on my hole. Soon, I climbed out of the cabin through the hole. I didn't leave any footprints because there was grass on the ground all the way to the canoe. I had my father's gun with me. I went into the woods to hunt a pig. I took the pig back to the cabin and let the pig's blood fall on the ground. Then I pulled some of my hair out and put it on my father's axe with some of the pig's blood. I took the pig outside and let it fall into the river. I hoped people might think the pig's blood was mine and think I was dead. I waited for night. Then, I got in the canoe and went to Jackson's Island. All that work made me very tired. I got out of the canoe and went into the woods. I found a place on the grass and went to sleep. Chapter Three: A Surprise Arrival. I woke up and saw the sun was high up in the sky. That meant it was after eight o'clock in the morning. The light came down through the trees, but it was still quite dark in the woods. I felt happy because I was free of my father. I was about to go to sleep again, but suddenly I heard a loud boom. I didn't know how far it was, 
But suddenly I heard it again. I jumped up and looked at the river through the leaves. I saw a lot of smoke on the water and a steamboat full of people. They think I'm dead. They're firing cannonballs into the water to make my dead body come up, I thought. Soon the steamboat got close to the island. I saw people I knew on the boat. Tom Sawyer, his Aunt Polly, my father, and Judge Thatcher. The boat went around Jackson's Island, then up the river and back to the town. I waited until I knew I was okay before I decided to catch some fish for breakfast. By the end of the day, I started to feel a little sad because nobody was on the island with me. Three days and nights passed in the same way. I fished, looked for fruit, and looked around the island. Early in the morning, on the fourth day, I went into the woods with my gun. I walked on the leaves, and suddenly my heart jumped. On the ground was a man. He was sleeping and had a blanket over his head. It was almost daylight. I kept my eyes on him. Soon, he woke up and threw the blanket off his head. Oh, was I happy to see him. It was Jim, Miss Watson's slave. Hello, Jim, I cried, and jumped out from behind the trees. He jumped up, very afraid. Then he said, Oh, please, don't hurt me. I never hurt anyone. Well, it didn't take me too long to make him understand I wasn't dead. I was so happy to have someone with me. I talked and talked, but Jim didn't say a word. After I told him my story, we sat on the grass together and had breakfast. Now Jim knew what really happened to me, but I didn't know what happened to him. So, Jim, why are you here? I asked. I ran away the night after you did. Old Miss Watson was not very nice to me, but I always thought she didn't want to sell me to anyone. But a slave trader came to her house often in the last few days, so I started to worry. I was right to worry, because I found out that Miss Watson wanted to sell me for eight hundred dollars to the trader. When I found out, I decided to run away. I swam across the river to this island and stayed here until you found me. After we told each other our stories, we climbed up a hill on the island. There, we found a cave and made it our home. Now that Jim was with me, my days on the island were much better. One night, we saw an old houseboat coming down the river. We got in our canoe and went over to it. When we climbed in through one of the windows, we saw a bed, two old chairs, and lots of things on the floor. A man was on the floor. I thought he was sleeping, but Jim said, I know a dead man when I see one. I suddenly felt very afraid. He went over to the man and put an old blanket on his face. I believe he died two or three days ago. Don't come here, because it's a very ugly thing to see, Jim said. I had no wish to see a dead man. I just helped Jim take a few things we might need. We climbed out of the houseboat again and went back to the island. Later, when I closed my eyes to go to sleep, I thought of the dead man and wished I knew why he was dead. Slavery in North America in the 1800s. A slave must work very hard for someone for no money. Today, there are very few countries in the world where slavery is still allowed, but in the past, it was very common in many countries in the world. When we think of slavery, we often think of the slaves in the southern states of the USA during the 1800s. The colonists who moved to America needed a lot of people to work on their land. Other colonists did not want to do this work, and the owners also did not want to pay people. So slaves, mainly from Africa, were brought to the country. 
The slaves traveled on overcrowded ships, and many died during the journey. British merchants made a lot of money from selling the slaves to the American colonists. Once the slaves arrived in America, slave traders took them to markets where they were bought and sold. The slaves had to work very hard and were often punished. Many slaves died because of the horrible way they were treated. Another very sad thing was that slaves were often separated from their families. Often mothers, fathers, and children went to different states. Because of their terrible lives, many slaves tried to run away. A secret system called the Underground Railroad was established by people who were against slavery. These people, called abolitionists, helped runaway slaves by giving them food and places to hide. As a result, many slaves escaped to the northern states and Canada. The differences of opinion about slavery in the North and South was one of the reasons for the American Civil War, which began in 1861. The war lasted four years and caused many problems even after it ended. The war started because some Southern states tried to separate from the Union. At first, President Abraham Lincoln took the Northern states into the war to try to save the Union. But freeing the slaves became important during the war. In 1863, President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This document stated that all slaves in the Southern states were free. Lincoln knew he had to wait until he won the war, but the proclamation told the South that the end of slavery was near. The Civil War ended in 1865. The Thirteenth Amendment was passed the same year the war ended. The amendment made slavery illegal throughout the United States. Life slowly got better for African Americans, but it took a long time. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act became law. This made discrimination based on race, color, religion, or national origin illegal. A lot of people, especially in the South, Protested against this new law, and there was a lot of violence. During the 1960s, the civil rights movement, with some of the important people connected to it, such as Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, became very important in improving the rights of all African Americans. Chapter Four: A Chance Meeting. After I found Jim, the days flew by. We lived just the way we wanted. We left Jackson's Island and went up the river. We wanted to get to the north. We traveled at night because there were no people on the river then. We did this because Jim was a runaway slave, and we didn't want anyone to see him. During the day, we left our canoe somewhere on the river. Then we slept, swam. And later had something to eat. Early one morning, I decided to look for some fruit for lunch. I was in the woods when I saw two men running. <laughs> Quick! Please help us. Some men and dogs are running after us. But we didn't do anything. They shouted. I had no time to think, so I decided to help them. I felt sorry for the two men. We got back to the camp. Jim made a fire, and we sat around it. One of the men was about seventy years old. He was bald and had a gray beard. He had an old hat on, a blue shirt, and old blue jeans. The other man was about thirty and was also wearing old clothes. Both of them carried big old bags. By the way the two men looked and talked, we could see they were frauds. But we didn't say anything, because we knew they might get us into trouble. I looked at the two men and asked, "What are your names?" They were quiet for a moment. Then the old man said, 
Just call me the king and him the duke. You must also be very nice to us, because we are a king and a duke. We knew it wasn't true, but we agreed to call them the king and the duke. We made breakfast and tried to do things the way we usually did. The two men asked us a lot of questions. They thought Jim was a runaway slave. I knew these men might get Jim into trouble. People could get a lot of money for a runaway slave. So I decided to tell them Jim was my slave. It was a good thing the two men didn't ask us any more questions. I hope they believe me, but I wasn't sure. From the day we met the king and the duke, things got much worse for us. We were often afraid of what the two men might do next. They were bad men and got us into trouble many times. But the worst adventure we had with them was the one I want to tell you about now. It all started the day the king found out that a rich man from a nearby village named Peter Wilkes was dead. The king thought he could find a way to get Wilkes's money. Peter Wilkes had three brothers. George, Harvey, and William. They were English, but Peter and George moved to America. Before he died, Peter Wilkes asked to see his brothers, Harvey and William. William, the youngest brother, was deaf and mute. But Peter Wilkes never saw his two brothers before he died. The funeral was the next day, but Harvey and William were still on their way to America. The king heard this story, and he thought of a way to get Wilkes's money. He could pretend to be Harvey, and the duke could pretend to be William. So that was how the king, the duke, and I met the Wilkes family and got into a lot of trouble. Listening activity. Well, how can I start? I suppose I can tell you about how I met the king. It was a few years ago now. I wasn't working, and times were difficult. One day, this man arrived in the town and came to talk to me. I suppose I knew he was a bit of a fraud, but I wasn't sure. He had a really convincing way of seeming to be an honest man. I was very interested, and I wanted to find out more about him. We talked about his life and his travels. He liked visiting many different places all over the country, but he really liked the South. For him, life was easier in the South. The people in the North had stricter laws. I found out he was bored of traveling alone, and was looking for someone to join him. He had quite a lot of money with him. I understood that I could also earn a lot of money. What choice did I have? There was no work for me, and I didn't have any experience or any friends. I don't really like what I do, but I am good at it. We only take from people who have a lot of money. They don't need so much. This is the only way I know how to survive. Listening activity. One. My name's John, and I come from a very poor family. My mother just had another baby, so I now have eight brothers and sisters. We all live in one small room, and we don't have much to eat. Sometimes I have to take some food, like an apple or an orange, from the market. Usually, I'm really quick, and I can run away before anyone sees me. But yesterday, I hurt my foot and couldn't run. I was arrested, and now I must wait for my punishment. Two. You can call me Doc, I suppose. I don't really have a home because I travel a lot. I often stay with rich families. They think I am a very honest man, so I stay with them for a while, and and then when I have the opportunity, I take their money, jewels, and other precious items. It's really easy. You just have to wait for the right moment. At the moment, I am wanted in five different states. 
I must not get arrested because I think the punishment would be heavy. 3. I live in the North, and things are very different. I first started thinking about the problems in the South a few years ago. My husband was traveling for business, and he met some slaves. He then told me about their lives. I think it's absolutely terrible. That's why I do what I do. I must help them escape. I hang a lantern outside my house so any slave will know that the house is safe. Then I help them move on to the next place. Sometimes it is dangerous. I'm not worried about me, but I do feel that I need to stay out of trouble so I can help more runaway slaves. 4. I'm a slave in a town near the Mississippi River. I live on a plantation, and I work in the fields. Until recently, I lived with my wife in a small cabin. My wife was very ill, but the master wouldn't let us stay in bed. She had to work and work. Things just got worse for her, and she couldn't move. That was the moment when she asked me. I didn't want to, but she kept asking me. The master still wanted her to work, and she was dying. So I helped her die. Now, I, I don't know what will happen to me. I, I can't read or write, so I don't know what is in the newspapers. Chapter 5 The Wilkes Family The morning the king learned about Peter Wilkes, he made the duke and me get on a steamboat with him. We left Jim a few miles up the river. He was supposed to wait for a few days until our return. We got to the village where Peter Wilkes died the night before. We got off the steamboat, and some men came to meet us. It was clear they knew someone was coming. The king made them think he was Harvey, and the duke was William. He also made them believe I was their servant. They all believed him because he spoke like an Englishman, and we all wore new clothes. One of the men said, We're very sorry you didn't arrive in time to see your brother Peter. He died last night. When they heard these words, the king and the duke started to cry. This made everyone else cry. Then the man took us to the Wilkes' house. Three girls stood at the door. The oldest said, We're Uncle George's daughters. Our father and mother died last year, so we live here now. The king already knew all about them, so he said, Oh, you must be Mary Jane. Yes, and these are my sisters, Susan and Joanna, answered Mary Jane. The three girls hugged the king and the duke. All of them cried together, and so did the townspeople. Then the king lifted his head and saw Uncle Peter's coffin in the corner of the room. He took the duke's arm, and they slowly walked over to the coffin. They both had tears in their eyes. I felt bad to see how the king and duke made everyone believe they were Harvey and William, but I also thought how dangerous it might be for me to tell everyone everything. The king stood up and said, Thank you all for coming here. We want all of Peter's good friends and family to have dinner with us this evening. Mary Jane gave the king a letter and said, Uncle Peter wrote this before he died. He wanted you to have it. Still with tears in his eyes, the king took the letter and read it in front of everyone. Then he said, Oh, my brother was such a good man. You all heard he left $6,000 for William and me. <laughs> you also heard that he hid the money in the basement. Nobody said anything. Then the king said, Uncle William and I must go down to the basement and get the money. We want everything to be out in the open. So the king, the duke, and I went downstairs to the basement. We found the $6,000 in a bag. The king said, 
I have a good idea. Let's go back upstairs and give this money to the girls in front of everyone. Yes, then we are sure to make them think we're Harvey and William, answered the Duke. We can find a way to get the money back later, added the Duke. So we all went upstairs again, and the king counted the money in front of everyone and gave it to the girls. This made everyone cry again. Mary Jane was quiet. Then she walked up to the king and said, Uncle Harvey, I want you to take this money back and spend it in any way you like. She smiled and gave the king the bag of money. Chapter 6 A Surprise in a Coffin. That night, we all had dinner with Peter Wilkes's good friends. After dinner, I quietly went upstairs to the king's room. I knew the bag of money was in there somewhere. I felt bad that the king and the duke wanted to steal the money Peter Wilkes left for his family. I also felt bad that Mary Jane immediately gave the $6,000 back to the king. So, I decided to take the money and hide it. I thought, after I leave, I can write to Mary Jane and let her know where I hid the money. That way, her family can get it back. I sat on the king's bed and saw a hole in the mattress. I put my hand inside and felt the bag of money. I took it out and returned to my room. I waited until everyone went to bed. Then I very quietly went downstairs to find a place to hide the money. The front door was locked, so I had to find another way out. Suddenly, I heard someone on the stairs. I ran to the living room and saw the coffin in the center of the room. It was slightly open, and you could see the dead man's face. I didn't have time to think of where to hide the money, so I put it in the coffin. Then I closed it and hid behind the door. Mary Jane came into the room and sat next to her uncle's coffin. She started to cry softly. I felt very sorry for her. I quickly left the room and went up to bed. The next day, the funeral took place with no problems. Nobody found the money, and the king didn't know it wasn't in his room. On the second day after the funeral, the king held an auction. He wanted to sell Peter's land and hoped to make a lot of money. The auction took place in the afternoon in the town square. The auction was almost over when a group of men arrived. They brought two men with them, an old one and a young one. One of the men in the group said, Here are Harvey and William Wilkes. These two men are surely frauds, answered the king. To me, it was clear these two were the real brothers. But what a show the king and duke put on. They made almost everyone believe the two men were frauds. But suddenly, the old man said to the king, If you're Harvey Wilkes, tell me, what tattoo did Peter have on his body? For the first time, both the king and the duke looked afraid. But the king didn't give up. He smiled and said, The tattoo is an arrow. You're lying, shouted the old man. Then someone said, Wait, there's only one way to discover the truth. We must dig up the coffin to see what's on Peter's body. Everyone shouted, Hooray, let's go! So they took the five of us to the graveyard. I was very afraid. I thought, it's getting dark. This is a good time to try to run away. But a very big man held my arm. There was no way for me to run away. Some of the men started to dig. It started to rain very heavily, but they did not stop. The man dug up the coffin and opened it. Nobody could see anything because of the rain and the dark. Suddenly, lightning lit up the sky. It was just enough time to see the bag of money sitting on the dead man's body. Shouts filled the air. The man suddenly let go of my arm. I started to run very fast. 
It was very dark, but the lightning helped me to see which way to go. The minute I was far enough from the town, I looked for an empty boat and jumped in. Soon, I got to the place on the river where Jim was hiding. I jumped in our canoe and shouted, "Quick, Jim! Thank God we're free of them at last!" Jim had a big smile on his face. He was so happy to see me again. But we had no time. Just when I thought we were out of danger, the lightning lit up the sky again to show us the king and duke. They climbed into the canoe. Now we knew more trouble was ahead. Chapter Seven: Trouble for Jim. After the king and the duke returned, the king was very angry with the duke. He thought the duke stole the bag of money and put it in the coffin. The duke thought the same thing about the king. I was happy because that meant they didn't think I did it. After their return. Life got quite difficult for the king and the duke. They couldn't make any money in their usual dishonest ways. Things got worse and worse for them. Jim and I became worried because the two of them often whispered to each other. They didn't want us to hear what they said to each other. I didn't say anything to Jim, but I was sure they wanted to sell Jim back into slavery. They knew people could get a lot of money for a runaway slave. I soon found out I was right. One morning, I came back to our camp and saw that Jim was gone. I knew the king and the duke were in a nearby town. They went there to make some money. I felt so sorry that Jim was gone. I decided to go to the village to try to find out where Jim was. On my way to the village, I saw a boy on the road. I stopped and asked him, "Did you see a black man around here?" Yes, he's a runaway slave, and they took him to Phelps Farm, about two miles from here," answered the boy. "Who gave him up?" I asked. "An old man. He got forty dollars for him," answered the boy. I decided to go straight to Phelps Farm. I didn't know how I could free Jim again, but I knew I had to try. I got to the farm and looked around. It was a sunny, hot day. The farm was a cotton plantation with a white wooden fence around it. I climbed over the fence and walked to the house. I didn't know what to say, but I would think of something. Suddenly, a woman came out of the house. I thought she must be Mrs. Phelps, and she's running right over here. Oh no! What can I do? But I didn't have time to think of anything because she ran right to me and gave me a big hug. Oh, you're here at last," said the woman. Then she added, "Let me look at you, dear nephew." I didn't know what to say, so I just stood there. Oh, don't be so shy, Tom. It's not at all like the Sawyers to be shy," <laughs> she said, laughing. I couldn't believe my ears. So the Phelps family expected Tom Sawyer to arrive. How could it be? Now I really didn't know what to do, so I just smiled and said, "Yes, it's really me, Mrs. Phelps." Oh, you can call me Aunt Sally. After all, I am your aunt," she said. We went into the house together, and I met Uncle Silas. I was so happy they thought I was Tom Sawyer. It wasn't difficult for me to pretend to be Tom because I knew all about him. I told them all about Tom's aunt Polly and his brother Sid. Aunt Sally and Uncle Silas both believed I was Tom. Suddenly, I heard a steamboat on the river. I thought, "Oh no, maybe Tom is on that steamboat now, and he's coming here." I must make up an excuse to leave so I can tell him what happened. I looked at Aunt Sally and said, "I have to go back into town to get my suitcase." It was too heavy to carry all the way here. Your uncle Silas can take you on our wagon," said Aunt Sally. "Thanks, but I know how to drive the horses," I answered. So I got on the wagon and started for the town. Halfway there, 
I saw Tom Sawyer on the road. His mouth fell open when he saw me. You must be a ghost because you're supposed to be dead. He cried. No, you can see that I'm not dead. I answered. Then what are you doing here? Asked Tom. There's not much time to explain. Just get on the wagon and let's go to your aunt Sally's house. I'll tell you everything on our way there. I answered. So Tom got on the wagon with me. I started to tell him all about my adventures, but suddenly we saw lots of people down the road. They walked past us, and we saw something horrible. They had tarred and feathered the king and the duke. I knew those two were very bad men, but I still felt sorry for them. Chapter Eight: The Great Escape. By the time we got back to Aunt Sally's house, Tom knew everything. We decided to tell Aunt Sally that Tom was his brother Sid. I took his suitcase and pretended it was mine. Aunt Sally was very surprised to see us both arrive, but she was so happy to have, she thought, both of her nephews with her. She put us in the same room together. That night we went to bed early. And waited until everyone else went to bed. Then we climbed out of the window. We looked around, but we didn't know where Jim was. Then Tom cried, "I know where they put Jim. He's in that shed over there." So we went to the shed and looked inside through a small window. Sure enough, there was Jim. When he saw us, he couldn't believe his eyes. "It's Huck, and there's Tom too!" he cried happily. Jim, don't worry. We know how to help you run away. I said. We explained how we could help him, and then we went back to the house. Every night, we climbed out of our window after everyone went to sleep. We dug a hole into Jim's shed so he could use it to run away. On the night we wanted to run away, we climbed out the window after everyone went to bed as usual. While we were standing in the garden behind a tree. We saw some men with guns. We knew we had to be very careful. We got to the shed, and Jim climbed out of the hole. As we climbed over the fence, the men began to shoot at us and ran after us. We ran to the river, got in our canoe, and could still hear the men's shouts. I smiled and hugged Jim. Now you're a free man again, Jim. I said. We were all very happy, and Tom cried. Wow! I even got a bullet in my leg. Jim and I were suddenly very worried. I took some old clothes and made a bandage for Tom's leg. He cried, "No, hurry up! There's no time." But Jim didn't want to go. He wanted to find a doctor for Tom first. Tom didn't want us to do it, but finally I agreed with Jim. I took the canoe and went to find a doctor while Jim stayed behind with Tom. I went back into town and found a doctor. I took him to our canoe, but he saw it and said, "This canoe is too small for two people. Tell me where your friend is. I can go, and you can stay here until I return." I agreed, but I didn't like it. I was so tired. I went to sleep behind a tree. When I woke up, I saw the sun in the sky. I slept all night, and now I didn't know where the doctor was. I decided to go back to Phelps Farm and tell them everything. I thought it was the best way to help Tom. I got to the farm and saw a lot of people in the garden. Tom, Jim, and the doctor were there. The people wanted to hurt Jim, but the doctor stopped them and said, "He may be a runaway slave, but he's a good man. He helped me with the boy's leg." Let's lock him in the shed so he can't run away again. Said Uncle Silas. Tom suddenly cried, "You've no right to. Nobody can lock Jim up again because he's not a slave anymore. He was Miss Watson's slave, and she died two months ago. Before she died, she made him a free man." I couldn't believe my ears, and Jim was so happy to know he was a free man. Tom told everyone everything we did and who we were. 
Now everyone knew everything, and we were all very happy. But there was one more thing I was still worried about. I looked at Jim and said, "What do I do now? I can't go back home because of my father. I'm sure he's got my six thousand dollars from Judge Thatcher." Don't you worry, Huck. Your father can't hurt you any more," said Jim. "How do you know?" I asked. "Remember that old houseboat we saw on the river one night? There was a dead man on the floor, and I—I I didn't let you look at his face." I didn't let you because it was your father, Huck," said Jim. And so that was how our adventures came to an end, and we all got our freedom, at last. <laughs>